Welcome to the Bridge Metro West. You made it here Saturday night. Who's ready for a touch of God? Yes. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to just jump full on in into worship. We've had a great um, experience already with Ken. He was here Friday night, uh, last night, and he was here with our teams this morning. And he's packing heat. He's ready to meet uh, this evening with all y'all. And so if you're new to the bridge, I think some of you I've talked with at the door, this was your first time here. Just raise your hand just to let me know. Okay, if you're new, I think some of you found us last night. If you need the restrooms, you cannot get lost. Just go down the hallway and all the way to the back through the kitchen and you'll find a men's room and a ladies room. We also are so excited that Ken brought wonderful materials to equip you and so we want that we want you to go home filled up in your spirit with tools that you can bring to your family and your friends and be equipped because it is about transforming culture it's about transforming our world for the glory of the king I'm so thankful that you're here. I'm so thankful that your hunger uh, caused you to come here tonight. I'm so thankful that you could have done so many other things, but you said, I'm hungry for the move of God. I'm hungry to be touched by the Holy Spirit. I'm hungry to gather with other believers, to press in, to find that very thing that God has released over this region. I'm gonna just reach up my hands right now and say by faith, I want everything, God. God has for us. I want everything. I'm, I'm here, Holy Spirit. I'm here, Holy Spirit. We're here for you, Holy Spirit. Let's right now enter into a time of worship because he is here. He is worthy. He sits enthroned on our praise. So let's do this, Lord. Let's just lift up our voices right now. Come on. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we love you. Come on, let's go. Let every faith that has breath raise 
Jesus, would you come stir it up from the inside out, Father? Would you come and stir us up from the inside out?
of it all Give you a Jesus You ain't above it all You ain't above it all There is no higher name Jesus you reign at all that all of heaven and the earth erupt in song sing hallelujah to the everlasting one there is no higher name Jesus you reign above it all you reign above it all it all yes you reign above it all oh, oh, oh. Jesus you
Cause I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear Yes, we are your children We are your children Yes, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Your mercy never fails me And all my days I 
been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing on the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice
Jesus. I just got to fly, Jesus. You're calling us higher, deeper, higher and deeper.
And the Father says to you We only get to lift up this worship on this side of heaven. It's the only place it happens. Once you're there, everybody's doing it. It's, it's like it's done. You only get to do this worship for him on this side of heaven. So tonight, can we just thank Jesus for just who he is tonight? It could be loud, it could be soft, it doesn't matter. Can we just lift up his name?
have no equal now and forever, God.
beauty of the Lord. Just let him wash over you just a little longer tonight. I'm not going to pull you into anything as normally would, but the beauty of the Lord is here. The word says, draw near while he's near. And you can debate my theology all you want, but there are times where he deposits himself in the manifest reality of the present. I understand he's in us, he moves upon us, but there are moments of the beauty of the Lord. So, yes, allow him to wash over you, but draw near. near. Come on. you beautiful one Jesus Yeshua the anointed one exalted lifted up name above all names seated at the right hand of the Father fire in your eyes a scepter in your hands a sword that proceeds from your mouth and on your robe and on your thighs King of kings, Lord of lords, who is like this one, this beautiful one? Even your feet are lovely, for you stand upon the mountain of the Lord and you release and bring good news to the poor, to the weary, to the captive, to the mourning came with life and life abundantly life everlasting life that doesn't go away it flows from the beauty of who you are and your powerful name the name that is above all names the name that only you know every letter every curve coursing with power innate in your name power beauty eternity salvation righteousness holiness and so we draw near to you tonight god and i pray that we would allow your nature to overtake our nature god that even in the twinkling of an eye that you would transform us from one level of glory to another level of glory tonight oh in your grace in that unmerited favor oh god that as we move from this place tonight we could say that on this day in that native massachusetts we were never the same again because we want to be known as a people who have been with god i'm not marked by my doctrine i'm not marked by the name and the names of men i am marked by the name of the one who is above all other names who is above all other gods who is above all presidents and powers and rulers and authorities he is king he is jesus and he's seated upon a throne that explodes into thunders and lightnings god if we could just peer into who you are tonight let us see let us see take the scales take the scales let us see a little more
ancient truths, ancient truths, ancient truths. There's nothing new under the sun. You preceded it and you'll go beyond it till the day comes where we will have no need for light for the light will come from the Lamb. So we're not asking you to do anything unusual tonight. King Jesus, just come and be yourself. Lamb of God and Lion of the tribe of Judah. Come. Be as you are. Just don't leave us as we are. good so good so good you know I don't want to tell you to be seated if you can but be seated if you can thank you worship team you guys are awesome Well, I don't know how it is out there, but it's saucy up here. I guess it's an unusual word when I travel. People get weirded out when I say saucy, but it's right. It's saucy. It's the good sauce. We're gonna um, receive an offering for Ken later, but. Uh, no, but just come on up, man. It's saucy up here. How many were here last night? That's good, because we're going to build on last night, tonight, and tomorrow. And um, last night was a really, uh, I mean, it's Ken. What do you want? I mean, it was good. It was, I don't know. It was amazing. It was, you know, watch it if you didn't. And I, I have to watch it again because, I, you know, don't worry. You're not the only one who can't take notes fast enough. <laughs> it's on the interwebs. We're good. So, Father, I thank you for this man of God, this father in the faith, this apostolic teacher. And we receive him as such once again here tonight. We once again pray strength into his physical body. I think he got a good night's rest, but more, Lord. <laughs> more, Lord. <laughs> no, not rest. More strength. Rest on your own time. And I thank you for family. And I thank you for the family that's here that's just family because you we are united in the bonds of the Spirit, just so evident when family gathers together. It's, it's real. It's palpable, God. And so tonight we sit at your table. Would you open our hearts? Would you soften our hearts? Prepare our minds. Do what you can do, Lord. Do what only you can do and make us ready to receive deep in the soil of our hearts, the seeds that are being cast tonight, that they would sprout, that they would grow, and that we would be oaks of righteousness for all the world to see. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you give an awesome New England welcome to Ken Fish. Thanks, bro. You know, before we get started on, uh, on the message tonight, I want to ask a question. How many of you here right now were also at the uh, session this morning that I did for the team and, and students from the school? Okay. Um, for those who weren't here, uh, sorry to be telling an insider thing, but I, I want to remember to do this before I forget to do this. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, shoot. I hate this. <laughs> 
Right, right. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Greta. Thank you. Um, was not a word of knowledge. You're cheating. <laughs> Um, so when I was telling the story of the guy who got healed, I left out a detail that I thought of in the moment, and then it slipped my mind, and I forgot to tell it, so I'll just share this. His father, remember, who had been sinned against by his mother, he had gout in his feet. So when, when we were talking about why did he get afflicted in his feet, and I, you know, I've this is a statistic, I, a statistic I commonly throw out when it's appropriate, uh, that there are 70 trillion combinations of the human genome. And so particular people and particular families, just due to the way their genetics combined in the randomness of genetic combination with that little dash of divine sovereignty, um, his family has a weakness in the feet. So his father had gout. Where did he get afflicted with his razor blades and nail feeling? In the feet. Now you know why he was afflicted in his feet. So um, again, for those of you that weren't there, this makes no sense at all. But this is my last chance to talk to them collectively without doing something unnatural in the morning service. So. There we go. All right. We were talking about the integrated healing model, which is not what we're talking about tonight. And so I, uh, I wanted to just clarify that. And boy, am I glad I told you, Greta, what I forgot to tell them this morning, because right at that moment, I was having a senile moment. Yeah. Good thing. Whew. All right. So now, tonight, again, we're talking about ministry in the marketplace. What does it mean to serve God in the marketplace if you're not called to the ministry which is again the exit ramp most people are trying to take um, so we're going to go tonight to the book of Daniel and by way of backdrop let me just say this Daniel lived at the end of the Judean kingdom and for those who don't really know biblical history very well there was a split in the kingdom of Israel into a northern kingdom which continued to be known as Israel and the southern kingdom which became known as Judah. Now they, they had obviously common lineage and ancestry. David had been their unified king. Solomon had been their unified king. But when Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who was David's grandson, when he came to the throne, Basically, he, he triggered a revolt, and the ten northern tribes left and created their own kingdom under a man named Jeroboam. Now, you don't necessarily need to be completely fluent in all this stuff, but the north kingdom ends in the year 722 B.C., or the 8th century B.C., and the, the southern kingdom of Judah comes to an end. And by the way, it's destroyed by the kingdom of Assyria, which is in the Middle East. Um, kind of directionally towards the lower part of Iraq today. And then uh, Babylon comes along approximately 150 years later. It's not exact, but it's easier to remember that than the exact number of years. So about a century and a half later, Babylon comes and wipes out Judah, and that's the end of it all until the time of the restoration under Ezra and Nehemiah. <clears throat> now, just before the destruction of the south kingdom of Judah, Jeremiah the prophet had been raised up. And he prophesied during the time of Josiah, who was a reforming king who essentially tried to save the nation by bringing them back to righteousness. And it was a, it was a partial, I mean, it was a wholehearted effort on Josiah's part. And of all the Judean kings, he gets the best marks in the Bible. There's a few others that are decent, um, Hezekiah, Asa, Uzziah, but none of them gets an A, and Josiah gets an A+. Plus. And there's lots of reasons why, but anyway, I'm, I'll be preaching three sermons here, so I better just leave it at that. But anyway, he prophesies during the time of Josiah right up to the end. And, um, and then the city is destroyed, and the Judean kingdom is wiped out, and that's the end. But Jeremiah, in his, um, in his prophecies, and Jeremiah is a particularly difficult book for most people to get their arms around for this reason. It says 
in the book of Jeremiah that while Jeremiah, you know, he wrote down his prophetic words and at one point he's standing in front of the second to the last king, his name's Jehoiakim, and he's reading out his prophetic words that he'd written down and as he would read, Jehoiakim would take a knife, slice off a piece of the scroll and throw it in the fire, which is a pretty good way of saying, I don't think your words are worth anything. But obviously at some later time, he recapitulated his words. Maybe he'd had copies or drafts. And, but anyway, when the book of Jeremiah gets compiled, it's still an inspired book, but it's out of order chronologically. So when you're reading Jeremiah, you can get all balled up in it pretty quickly unless you reorder the chapters, which most people don't know to do. And so it gets confusing. But I do want to point out two things in the book of Jeremiah that are going to be material to what we're going to talk about tonight. In Jeremiah tw chapter 25, uh, the Lord says this. I'm going to read verse 8 and then jump down. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words... Behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. So it's not just Judah that's going to get take it on the chin. It's going to be all the other kingdoms around the Moab and Edom and so on, many others. Um, and then he says, verse 11, this whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, meaning Babylon, and the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. The Lord doubles down on this, and he says in Jeremiah 29:10, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Well, two times Jeremiah prophesies to the uh, fading kingdom of Judah that it will be 70 years, actually in two places, but he actually says it three times. So it's pretty well anchored into their minds, if they think Jeremiah is legitimate, that it's going to be a 70-year exile. Now remember, King Jehoiakim, he didn't think much of this. The other thing I want to remind you of, and this is all backstory, you know, everything, if you're going to interpret the scriptures correctly, you have to understand the context. And most of the time today, nobody goes after the context. They just pull something off the page and start slinging away. This is a really good way to get into trouble. <clears throat> the other thing I'm going to say before we dive into the book of Daniel is that Daniel, living at the end of the Judean kingdom, knew the book of Genesis. Now, that should be obvious but you might not have ever thought about it. So the Torah was the holy book of scrolls for the Jewish people, and they had many of their historical books had been written, Joshua, Judges, um, by, the end of the, by, by the end of this period, Samuel, first and second Samuel, had been written. The books of the kings, that's a little less clear, but Samuel would have been written. And so Daniel, as a young man, had been raised apparently in the ways of the Lord as we will see in just a moment. Um, and so just like we draw on our scriptures, meaning all 66 books of the Bible, Daniel didn't have as many books to draw from, but he would have been trained in these scriptures and it framed his thinking. It was part of, what he, part of how he thought about life. It gave him, we'll say, a Jewish worldview, not a Christian worldview. And so... Daniel would have known everything I told you last night about Joseph. Mm -hmm. 
The lights are coming on, are they not? And so this means that when Daniel goes into captivity, just as Joseph had gone into captivity, albeit for very different reasons, and in very different eras, uh, when, when this happens, uh, you know, Daniel at least has some sort of a reference line, some sort of a paradigm of what we ought to do when we find ourselves where we don't want to be. And so it's with that that I want to start reading the scriptures to you so we can talk about how to live as a Christian in an unchristian world. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now this is a direct fulfillment of what I already read to you out of the book of Jeremiah, because he had said, Babylon will come. And the false prophets had all said, Babylon will not come. And Jeremiah said, they're all lying, Babylon will come, and Babylon came. And note that this is during the time of Jehoiakim. This is the guy that blew Jeremiah off. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Now, you don't know what I just read, but let me just say, for a Jew who believes that God is the all-powerful God and the supreme ruler of the universe, to see these holy vessels from their temple placed in the temple of the foreign god of Babylon, this is, this is worse than the destruction of the nation. This is the end of their religion. This is, a, this is a shattering of an entire spiritual paradigm, and they're literally thinking, how can this even be? And so with this, the entire nation is thrown into a spiritual crisis. It's bad enough to be attacked, but I mean, they had wars all the time. You know, you got to do is read the Old Testament. People are always fighting. But, but now we've lost our holy, sacred vessels, and it is as though God himself is in captivity. Which is to say, he has no power. Which is to say, he isn't answering prayers. Which is to say, we have no hope, because we have no rescuer. This is our future. There is none. Our future is... Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, this is referring to Judah, but it's using the term Israel, <clears throat> both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them these names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. And then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who, are, who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. And so a deal is struck. Stop reading here. And they decide to do this 10-day trial. Now, this has become known as the Daniel Fast. And let me just say, it has nothing to do with losing weight. It has nothing to do with, um, you know, a lighter weight fast than, like, going on nothing except water. This is all something that has been popularized by Rick Warren, which I guess if you're getting people to fast on any level, that's good. But that's not what this is about. 
This is about Daniel is a Jewish captive, and he's obviously the leader of these of this small band of young men. Um, and he looks at the food and the and the wine, the drink, and specifically the issue is meat. And for those of you that were in the session this morning, you don't have to have been in there to understand this. Uh, Paul goes on and on about food sacrifice to idols and how you'll become demonized if you eat this stuff. And by the way, lest you think this is just a, a red herring, in the book of Revelation to two of the seven churches, Jesus calls them out for eating food sacrifice to idols. This is a big deal in the mind of God. Because if you're partaking of the table of demons, you partake of demons. So Daniel knows all of this, and he re, it says he resolved. That means he made up his mind, come what may, not to eat that meat or drink that wine because it was dedicated to the Babylonian gods. If he had done so, it would have been to deny the very faith that he professed. And so we see in this that Daniel is a young man, I would say, of some conviction, and uh, we'll, we'll unpack him a little bit more. But that's the, that's the backdrop to everything we're going to talk about tonight. And it says he was carried away as a youth. Now, if he's a youth, he's not yet a man. And that means he's not yet bar mitzvah, which means he's probably about junior high age when all this goes down. And so what that means is at a very early age in life, he is stripped of all of his spiritual mentors, his rabbis, his priests, he is stripped of his parental input. Whatever's in him is what is in him, and now he's under the gun. He's on the firing line. And he's in an environment that nobody would want to be in. I don't know if you caught it, but he's placed in the care of the chief of the eunuchs. Generally, you wouldn't be under the care of the chief of the eunuchs unless you were one. So as part of being deported to Babylon, it doesn't strictly say it, so maybe this didn't happen, but it's pretty likely he was relieved of his manhood as we might say and you might say would God let that happen to his own apparently he did and it was all because of that thing we read in Jeremiah it's because of the evil in the land and here's the problem the righteous suffer with the unrighteous when judgment comes so all this talk about well you know whatever's going to happen to America we're going to be fine because we're in the ark good luck it didn't work out too well and by the way, in case you need another example of that, don't forget the story of Esther. Here's a beautiful young woman, and uh, this lecherous king says, find me the top 100 women in my entire kingdom, make them beautiful for a year with creams and ointments and haircuts, and send them to the gym so they have hot bodies, and then I'm going to sample each one, and whichever one I decide I like the best, that'll be my new wife. And so the rest of them are left deflowered, and uh, without much for hope of a prospect. Life gets tough when you're in these kinds of environments. And I'm, I'm trying to help you understand that because we're talking about what it means to live as a Christian in an unchristian world, as all of us do. There was a time when America was, I'd say, predominantly Christian in its ethos, imperfectly lived, admittedly, but, but generally the, the, the thrust and the sentiment of the country and the way we did what we did, the laws we made, the way we ruled and administrated. And if anybody, you know, got enough of a voice in the public square that they might stand before Congress or the president or something and say, hey, this is unrighteous what's going on and here's scripture to back it up. Eventually, as Martin Luther King said, the arc of history tends towards justice. And so things would get knocked back into line because this is what it says in the word of God and this is what we ought to do and so this is what we're going to do. That is no longer a given in America. All right, well, that's all backstory. Recently, I was listening to John Maxwell, um, whom many of you will recognize. He's a great uh, speaker and teacher on leadership. He sold over 31 million books, which means like one book for every 10 people in the country. Now, probably it doesn't really quite work out that way. It's more like, you know, each person who buys his stuff likes it and buys 20 of his books. But anyway, 31 million books. But what you might not know about John Maxwell is that prior to founding his current organization called Enjoy, uh, he was the senior pastor of Skyline Wesleyan Church in San Diego, California for about 15 years. Well, John was sharing that his publisher 
had once asked him to write a book on business ethics. Business ethics. Because he does a lot of training and teaching on business, and it's, it's the case that even non-Christians like his stuff, because it's really good and it works. So after spending some time researching this topic of business ethics, he concluded that there was no such thing as business ethics, and he told his publisher, I can't write that book. Now that's not to say there are no ethics in business. What John Maxwell had concluded was that there is just right and wrong. There is only right and wrong. Now that statement sounds pretty stark, pretty narrow in a world that is increasingly colored by shades of gray. But in fact, seeing everything in shades of gray may exactly be the problem of our age. And I'm going to submit to you right up front, right now, that if you are in the marketplace in any capacity, you are there to be salt and light. Light isn't dark. And so however you do it, just like Daniel, who resolved not to eat that food and drink that wine because it was dedicated to a foreign god, you are supposed to stand up and be righteous in the marketplace. And it might cost you your life, or your job, or your manhood, or your womanhood. It could. But this is what Jesus said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. And so the notion that we live in Christian America and that, you know, therefore everything will be okay, I think that is, um, that might have worked well in the 60s, maybe the 70s, for sure in the 50s, but it's not the reality we're living in today. And that's actually why I like Daniel, because his context is much simil more similar to ours than maybe to that former time of what we called Christian America, which is fading away. There's a few older people in this congregation who may remember that America, but you know, much of America does not remember that time and it's not really part of their conversation. So back home in LA, I've seen on many occasions uh, cars with bumper stickers that read, he who dies with the most toys wins. Yeah, I'm, seriously. But now, if our goal in life is merely prosperity or to make it to the top or to be popular, then that might be one way of putting it. You could say that's consistent with your objective. I'm not saying it's worthy, but it's consistent anyway. But if our goal instead is to represent our Heavenly Father well, to so let our light shine before men that they will glorify our Father in Heaven, which is what Jesus told us to do in the Sermon on the Mount, then we must live by a different ethic. Dying with the most toys, or the most power, or the most popularity, this is no longer your goal. And if it is your goal, lose it tonight. Just walk up here and... Uh, uh, we don't have a basket. I was going to say, put it in the basket. But, but yeah, lay it on the altar because that's no longer your goal in life. Now, I'm not saying you won't get raised into a position where there is prosperity, power, and so forth. Maybe you will, but, but that's no longer your objective. So we have to live by a different ethic that's consistent with what we are called to do. There we go. There's the baskets. Love it. Thank you, Jenner. Okay. So you can bring your objective or you know, your goal of popularity, wealth, fame, all that into the basket. So to quote another management guru, Stephen Covey, we need to begin with the end in mind and know that this is, this is not why we exist in that context. We exist to represent our father well. So living Christianly in an unchristian world can be very difficult uh, because we face adversity. Daniel did. Joseph did. Um, because we deal with unscrupulous people. I was talking with uh, somebody this afternoon, I probably should not say who in case this thing goes out on the web stream and who knows where it lands. But I was talking with somebody who's sitting in the room tonight, earlier today, about somebody with whom she works, and she said, this person is not a good person. They, they have evil motives, it's obvious from the decisions they make and the choices they make. And you know, you really kind of pushed me a little bit last night when you said I have to yield to this and submit to this person and not say things behind their back, which I've been guilty of and I realize I need to stop doing that. So we face unscrupulous people. And the need to succeed, especially let's say if you've got sales targets to hit, or you know, you're some sort of a government administrator 
<clears throat> and you're supposed to implement some program and show that you're making progress with that, the need to succeed, however that gets measured, can push us to the margins and beyond of what is right and wrong. And going back to what I said, there is only right and wrong. So this book of Daniel that we're going to look at here, this gives us a picture of how we can do that, how we can do it. I'm mostly about hows these days in my teaching. I like big picture concept stuff, but eventually we've got to boil this down to what are we going to do. So this book tells us how to do it even when nothing seems to be in our favor. Nothing was in Daniel's favor. Remember, God is silent. The temple is destroyed. He doesn't see his parents or his rabbis or his priests. They've either been killed or enslaved themselves, but you're on your own. So it is possible to live Christianly in an unchristian world. I'm not saying it's easy to do. I'm saying it's possible to do. And so um, however we do it, it's a pursuit in itself worthy of what President Theodore Roosevelt once called the great devotions. The great devotions. And um, Roosevelt was using that language in the context of a... You'll see it on posters now and then. It is not to the man who succeeds, and he kind of lists all of that sort of success stuff, uh, that, that plaudits go. It is to the man left standing in the arena with sweat on his brow and dirt caked to his body and perhaps blood coming from his hands, but who has stood in the midst of conflict. Well, we've read already this passage out of Daniel, uh, the first little bit, and so let's just say this. Daniel was put into a difficult situation with a more difficult boss. Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man in the world. Surprise, surprise, he was a narcissist. And the Babylonians were uh, notorious for their, I would say, extreme violence in battle. They were, they, there was nothing of the Western way of war. Uh, they would do all kinds of things to people whom they captured in battle. And so, to say what we've summarized and go further, he's carried away as a youth, probably 12 or thereabouts, so maybe 6th grade, 7th grade. Um, he's put into the care of Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, and so Daniel may have lost his manhood as part of his deportation. He's working for Nebuchadnezzar, the very man who had destroyed not only his family and home, but his city. And he never returned to the life that he had known as a youth. He never went home. Um, the scripture says, you may not have caught it when I read it, so I'm pointing it out, that God himself gave the city into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. God himself did it. Why? Well, because of their sin. I read that in Daniel, uh, Daniel Jeremiah chapter 25. And so, by implication, this was a time when God of his own choice withdrew he was at least partially silenced. He distanced himself. So Daniel was relying on what he had learned of right and wrong from his parents and his teachers who were no longer at his side during this time of trial. And so with all of this, Daniel began his journey into the marketplace with four major points of adversity and crisis, both personal and faith-wise. And all I can say is, and we think we have it tough. Now Daniel was a Jew... I'm using him as a template for living Christianly in an unchristian world, but Jesus wouldn't be born for another six centuries. And so when I say living Christianly, I'm, I'm clear Daniel wasn't a Christian, but he was a believer, a legitimate, genuine believer. And in fact, he's called out in one other part of the Bible as one of the most righteous men who ever lived. And so for sure he's going to be in heaven. There's no doubt about this at all. Um, so he managed to live as a man of God in a very challenging situation. And there are seven things that helped him to survive and live as a man of God. And we're going to look at them tonight. Seven things. Um, we could say they helped him live Christianly in an unchristian world. Or Jewly in a non-Jewish world. I don't care. Whichever way you want to say it. All right. So seven things. The first of them is Daniel began with a healthy dose of self-respect. And this was reflected outwardly in the way he carried himself. 
Today we can call it identity. There's a ton of teaching out there in the church about our identity and our identity in Christ and you're loved by the Father and you were selected by him. And these things, all of them are true. I'm not in any way calling them into question. But I do want to say this. Um, all of this uh, is deeper than self-respect, but it absolutely includes self-respect. And I meet a lot of people today who claim that they know their identity in Christ and they do not have self-respect. And if you don't have self-respect, can I suggest to you that you don't actually know your identity in Christ? So the two go side by side. He didn't descend into self-pity over his circumstances, but he may have had many moments of feeling that way. This is part of what we have to do sometimes in life. We have to live the life that we know we should live, even when internally we don't feel like it at all. We might say, I feel like I'm dying, or I can't go on, or whatever. But this is just part of what happens in the adversity of a fallen world. Now, I'm still on this point one, but I want to break it down further, so I'm going to give you sub-points on this matter of self-respect. The first thing that tells us he had self-respect is he was well-groomed. In the translation I'm reading, which is the English Standard Version, um, it says that he had good appearance. Now, he may have been naturally a handsome man or boy or youth, whatever. You can't really change the way you were born nor the circumstances in which you find yourself. Um, but you can do the most with what you have, and he understood that first impressions matter. So he groomed himself well, washing his face and putting oil on his head. This is what it says of David after his own uh, child through Bathsheba died. And sometimes in life, that's about all you can do is put on your game face and carry on. Any of you who have seen Pastor Bill Johnson's message that he gave three days after Benny died would have a pretty good idea of what this looks like. I mean, Bill could have just let Chris take the pulpit or Dan Farrelly. Uh, Bill could have gone to ground. But he not only preached on the Sunday after, he preached last Sunday as well. And so you can't but respect a man for doing that. I'm not saying he's not feeling or that he's feeling great. I mean, he and Benny, I think they were in their 48th year of marriage. Um, you know, they, they obviously had a happy, good relationship. And now he's a widower, but he's putting on his game face anyway and showing up. And in the midst of all that, this is what he's doing. Sometimes, folks, when you are in a non-Christian world and you're a Christian, you don't like the environment you're in and you need to present a good appearance if for no other reason than that they will respect you, that you still have self-respect. And a lot of Christians today, we've been raised into a therapeutic culture. And so everything's about me and do I feel good and have I been massaged and did I get my inner healing or my pedicure or my mani-pedi or, you know, I had a bad hair day and, I, you know, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not really making it work. I, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking down and somebody needs to love and care for me and in the workplace, nobody cares. It's like being a gladiator. You know, if you're a gladiator in Rome and you're feeling sick and your number gets called, they're not going to say, so, yeah, sleep in and get some rest. You can go fight in the arena on another day. I'm just being real here. So he groomed himself well in the midst of his sorrow and his difficulty. And, and let's just stipulate to this as well. Daniel is in a fast-track training program like a corporation might put you through. you got three years, boy, to come up to speed with our language and literature as Babylonians and to learn to speak it fluently because at the end of that time, you're either going to fail, who knows what that might mean, but it ain't good, whatever it means, or you're going to be working for the king. So you got three years to deliver, and never mind that you're grieving the loss of your family and your city, and that's just the way it rolls. Now, I, ideally, in the church, of course, you might find some support and nurture and so on. That's part of why we go to church. But when you're out there in the workplace, the workplace is not the church. You're out there to do something for the Lord, also to earn a living. But you're out there with that objective, and so you can't let this become the place where you show all of your internal pain. The second thing about Daniel, I'm still on point one, that he had self-respect. The second thing is he was wise. The scripture says he was skillful in all wisdom. 
so skillful means he was he was adept he probably had a quick mind maybe he could see things from different perspectives beyond the one that he preferred um, he was able to take on board the collective wisdom of not only his own Jewish culture but whatever wisdom was in the Babylonian culture and so this idea of being skillful in wisdom isn't the same as simply having his head stuffed with facts it shows a much more emotional quotient than being a know-it-all he was quick on his feet um, he made good decisions even under pressure I remember when I was in business one time I was recruited by a large investment firm out here in the eastern US and I was at the time working for the government of Singapore in private equity and so I you know went to the interview and the day had gone pretty well and the way interviews like that go is you meet a bunch of people and pretty much you know once you leave their office they're passing among themselves did I like the guy or not and if you've done okay then you get to meet the big guy at the end of the day if you don't pass muster with the lower people you'll never even see the big guy so at the end of the day comes I think it was four in the afternoon from memory maybe it was five but I walk in and here he is and so I sit down with him and we, we talk and you know it's polite but he's sizing me up and I'm sizing him up hi Jeff you know this world too well <laughs> so this guy uh, asked me to give a couple of examples of places where I had made good decisions now this was business so in this case they were business decisions not life decisions but where I'd made good decisions uh, particularly in the midst of ambiguity where I had insufficient information and time was short and that's often true in the investment business isn't it Kai got to make that decision buy or sell you know in or out so you know we talked about that and apparently I answered well enough that you know he liked me and it went on from there and I got a job offer from that but but the bottom line is <clears throat> that's the kind of guy Daniel was and he didn't have a lot of mentoring going on after like I say maybe age 12 or 13 so he's got to he's got to be nimble on his feet he's got to have something that is you hear this word used somewhat in modern society um, he was resilient and this is very different from being a fragile person all right the third thing still under point one is it says he was endowed with knowledge that means he was well read he was constantly reading whatever was around him so that he could become better and he remembered things however he did that maybe he had his own you know when I when I read and study I have my own way of filing away information in my brain so that I don't forget it and people always say to me gosh Ken you're like a walking dictionary or you know encyclopedia where do you get all this well it's from all the reading I've done in the past and generally I can recall things except what I told you this morning and it's a good thing you helped me out with that so he could understand viewpoints other than his own and he could articulate them that's what made him appear to be balanced and reasonable even if he didn't agree with those viewpoints he could at least fairly represent them he understood the background and the context of things that made him a nuanced thinker with good judgment and like all transformational leaders and this is critical he had developed domain expertise he was good at something I mean he was really good at something now I don't mean interpreting dreams he happened also to be good at that but that was more of a gift from God that wasn't who he was and we don't really know exactly what his domain expertise was but what we do know is he seemed to be some kind of a nowadays management people call them level five leaders he was some kind of a level five leader because he ultimately rises to the highest level in the kingdom and so here's a question to ask yourself as we're thinking about this what are you really good at and if you're not really good at something what would you like to be really good at and what level of application are you willing to put into your life so that you become good at it what books are you willing to read maybe you don't have money to buy them right now fine go down to the library and get them there but however you're going to do that do it and this isn't just going to come because you're on Facebook and Instagram all the time liking the post of every traveling preacher in the country I mean you really need to like corral your time into things that matter does that make sense like I said uh, these, these, these talks are not meant to be easy they're meant to help you change so that you can achieve the goal and we already said what that is it's to represent our father well in a dark world the fourth thing still under point one 
is that he continued to learn. The scripture says he, under, he had understanding of learning. So he understood how to learn. You know what that means? He knew how to teach himself. He knew how to continue growing in whatever it was that he was doing. That, by the way, is in verse 4. So he, um, there's a saying that readers are leaders. And I would say this, he continued growing even when the subject matter of study as a pious Jew in pagan Babylon may not have been his first choice. So if you're employed anywhere, I don't care what your field is, you need to become the best person in not only your organization, but in the field in that subject matter. Well, that's hard, and I might miss you know, the prophetic meeting at church, then miss the prophetic meeting at church, I mean, I'm saying miss all the prophetic meanings because we're not supposed to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. But for a lot of people, their faith has become an excuse not to become the best in class of whatever they do. Does that make sense? And so that's what Daniel set himself to doing. I don't think he had any particular love for or interest in the ways of the Babylonian gods, the origins of Babylonian culture, the history of the Babylonian nation. Um, he probably had no interest in that. I don't think he wanted to read the book of Marduk or the lost books of Enki or the Anunnaki Bible or the Necronomicon, all of which were major texts of the day, all of which under Jewish law and Christian thinking to boot would classify as witchcraft and black magic. I'm not, I don't know if he read all that stuff, but he knew enough to kind of carry himself and be in that environment. And so in the doing of that, he, he what showed that he was part of their world. Remember what I said about knowing who you are in the, in the place where you are and earning the right to be heard. That's what Daniel was doing in all of this. Not only that, he could apply what he knew, so it wasn't merely book knowledge. He, you know, it, it's good to have that book knowledge, but you've ultimately got to go beyond book knowledge into applicable knowledge. And so, um, generally speaking, however you gain knowledge, whether in school or through self-learning or whatever, um, knowledge grows into wisdom with age. Generally, knowledge will grow into wisdom. It's applied wisdom. And so all of this reminds us of Proverbs 22, 29, which is probably on the tip of your tongue, but I will give it to you. It says, do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Well, Daniel is being groomed to stand before a king. And I can imagine that there were probably other young men who were also in a similar kind of a training program. So it's probably a fairly competitive environment. And they... They, they need to compete in order to survive. The fifth thing under this point one is he presented well and was careful of speech. The scripture says he was competent to stand in the king's palace. So he not only dressed himself well, he not only carried himself well, but he presented well and he was careful with his words. Now remember what I talked about yesterday with the whole thing of what do you say about your boss when you're in the office. So today we call this executive presence and it is always universally, in every culture, by the way, sought out in senior leaders, whether in business, politics, education, the military. In the military, they call it command presence. When an admiral or a general walks in the room, everybody knows that that's a, and it's not because of the stars on the shoulder. It's because of the bearing. It's the way they carry themselves. And so um, I could add to that, it's also, generally speaking, true in the church. Now, there are some goofball senior leaders in the church, just like there are in every society, but eventually these things find you out, and things have a way of self-correcting. So the goofballs go away. But the people who are legit, people like Bill Johnson, you know that they are who they are. And they, they don't really need to speak up and defend themselves, self-promote. They just, they just are that. So... All of this is under self-respect, point one. So query, do you have self-respect? And if not, I've given you a whole bunch of ways to measure it. So do a gap analysis on your, on your life and on your career and on your place in the marketplace and ask yourself, do I have self-respect 
such that I can gain traction. And if you don't, start making a list of what needs to change and how you're going to get there. You can work out all the details of that plan later on, but, but this is something that you take in hand and with God's help, you'll succeed at it. But if you don't even identify it, you'll never take it in hand and you will continue to be ineffective in the marketplace in representing the Lord. If, by the way, you don't have self-respect because you were beaten down and you know, had a horrible childhood and all that, um, that's okay. We have inner healing and deliverance. But the whole point of that is not that we go through endless cycles of inner healing and deliverance. It's that we would move on to transformation and ultimately come out of that. The thing that distresses me all the time is when I see people who've had that background and who don't grow into what they should be growing into. So I told you last night about this person I know, and if you couldn't tell from the way I told the story, I have a lot of respect for this woman. She didn't even finish college, right? But now she's about to make vice president in a major bank in San Francisco. Um, and by the way, this isn't the typical bank structure where VP doesn't really mean much. In this bank, it really does mean something. And that's why she was on the horn with 25 or 1,500 people giving a presentation. She, she is following these things, whether consciously or not, I don't know. But she's following these things, and it's paying off in multiple spades for her. So have self-respect with all of these pieces that I've laid out. All right, point two, how did Daniel make it? He was consecrated and committed to holiness. Scripture says, commit thy way unto the Lord and trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. The light of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It will shine brighter and brighter, even in a dark world, even when people don't like your faith, even when they dislike you. The person who was telling me today about having this one person for whom she worked that is not a good person also said I work a bunch among a bunch of non-Christians but they tell me that since they've gotten to know me they've never had more experience of God than in their entire life and she also said that um, when they have needs they bring them to her for prayer and when the others kind of make jokes about it and this is her peer group now not the boss uh, but when the others joke and so forth, they always say, yeah, but she knows God, and when she prays, things happen. Well, that's, that's traction. When, you, when you've got that testimony, and she wasn't bragging, she was just talking to me about her world and how last night's message had really spoken to her, and so tonight we're doing what amounts to a second part of that. So he was consecrated. He was committed to holiness. Are you committed to holiness? You know, the scripture admonishes us to do this not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. I know it sounds really out of date in a world where God's in a good mood, and no matter what you do, you can't make God love you any less. No matter what you do, you can't make him love you any more. And I'm obviously being taking shots at some things that are glib little Christian memes these days. The scripture says, strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And so Daniel made that decision, and it might have cost him his life. It didn't, but if it did, okay, it did. He resolved not to defile himself with the food and wine the king offered him, as we've already said. So in this, he faced and overcame the temptations of life's pleasures, which he might have rationalized due to his circumstances. I'm away from home. No one's going to know. I'm miserable. I'm depressed. I'm living in exile. I'm learning this stupid Babylonian Chaldean language that I don't want to speak. I'm having to learn about all their dumb laws and everything, and I hate my king. And, and so I think I'll get drunk, and I think I'll just pig out. I'll use food as comfort food, and right? He could have done that, but he didn't. Why? Because his awareness of God was greater in his own mind than the temptations before him. Which, as I already said, if he had succumbed to them, would have led him into idolatry and the betrayal of the very faith which he professed. This, by the way, is where many Christians hit shipwreck in their faith, and they wander from the faith. And their lives become meaningless, and sometimes they end up homeless, dead. It just kind of depends on how far down the slope they slide. 
So this kind of God awareness that Daniel carried, or we might call it God consciousness, except that sounds really new agey, and I don't want to sound like I'm a new age guy, but he was conscious of God all around him, all the time. He kept God forefront in his mind, even while he's doing all the work of Babylon. Um, this God consciousness is at the core of most devout, consecrated, powerful men and women of God, period. I mean, this would certainly be true of people like Bill Johnson and Randy Clark and Cheyenne. I mean, I could name a bunch of others, but, but this is part of what makes them tick. This is what makes them run. And so, again, we come back to, well, how am I doing with being God conscious at all times? And I'm not talking about religious in affectation. That's a different thing. But, you know, where am I with this? And, do I understand that God is with me? If God could be with Daniel in Babylon, God can be with you in whatever, EMC or Microsoft or wherever you might be working. So 70 years later, remember uh, Jeremiah had said it'll be a 70-year period, and he said it a couple of times. After the year 539 B.C., and now under a brand new administration, because in 539 Babylon fell in one night, to the Persian Empire, and now we have a complete regime change. And everything Daniel had had to learn about Chaldean history and culture and politics and the language of the Chaldeans. Now maybe, maybe, we don't know because it doesn't say, maybe because he was high enough up, maybe along the way he had learned to speak Persian and so maybe he was at least linguistically equipped and maybe as a senior level official in the administration of Babylon, he had some familiarity with Persian culture. Maybe he'd entertained envoys and things like that at different times. We don't really know, so you can't say it did or didn't happen for sure. But I'm just saying if it did happen, it would have been in a context like that, if it happened. But anyway, in 539, it's in that brand new administration. We now have a Persian empire underway. And um, he's given a command that he should not pray or worship any other god. And this comes about because under this new regime, he's, he's a very senior guy. Apparently they'd figured out he was a capable guy. And so they bring him in, and he's, he's, a, he's what's called a, a ruling satrap. And the, uh, the Persians had divided their entire empire into 120 provinces. You can think states if you want to do that, and it'll help you understand the concept. But they're known as satrapies, and each, each satrapy has a satrap over it. So they have three guys that are over all the 120, which is convenient because it breaks down that you have 40 for each of the senior guys. So he's basically keeping track of 40 states, if you want to say it that way. And it turns out that he's so good that they're going to make him the number two guy in the kingdom right under the king. This is very similar to what happened to Joseph. And I'm thinking, you know, he's looking back at Joseph and he's, you know, meditating on what is in the story of Joseph over and over and over again. And so he's in that position. And the guys that are around him, they realize, you know, this guy is clean. We, he never cheats. He never lies. He never goes home early. He never does anything that's against the rules and regulations. There is absolutely nothing that we're going to be able to pin on him. And so the one thing that we know we can get him is in the matter of his faith. So let's take him out on the matter of his faith. And so here I'm going to read this passage that describes everything I've just told you. And I wanted to tell you in advance so you'd know what you're hearing. It pleased Darius, that's the king, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Now this might be referring to something of the anointing of God, but it may also mean that he had a commitment to excellence in every single thing that he did. And good enough was never good enough. So he had this spirit of excellence, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Right there, verse 3. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, for they could find no ground for complaint nor any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. 
And then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. There will be some laws he won't break because they violate his faith, and no matter what we do, he won't violate that. So let's make a rule that will be a gotcha, and then we'll take him out. Could that happen to you? Sure it could. Don't kid yourself for a minute. But, on the other hand, God is able to rescue and deliver. So, you know, you trust the Lord in the midst of all of it. So Daniel feared God more than he feared men or women, and he, but he didn't flaunt it brazenly. He wasn't self-righteous about it. He wasn't haughty, and he didn't provoke conflict. And so when he knew that this decree had been issued that forbid prayer to his God, instead he went quietly to his dwelling and prayed anyway as he had always done three times a day. Three times a day. Now, the scripture says that when he prayed, he would open his windows toward Jerusalem. And, you know, he's in the Middle East, so it's warm. There's no screens. There's no air conditioning. I don't know how loudly he was praying, but they could have planted a spy just outside of the window, maybe on the roof. Uh, maybe he was on the ground floor. Again, we don't really know. So maybe somebody could have just stood outside, didn't need to climb up on the roof. But somehow there was something predictable about Daniel. By the way, that's part of his piety, right? He had a regular practice of his religion. Um, there was something about him that they, they knew, man, when those windows are open and it's this time of day, he's probably praying. And so they catch him in the act. And in the midst of it all, he still refuses to bow. This, by the way, is what ends him up in the lion's den. So as we like to say, even today, and we get that language from the book of Daniel, he was literally thrown to the lions. You might be thrown to the lions for being unbending in your righteousness. But again, don't be self-righteous. Um, and in all of this, of course, he's refusing to get caught up in palace politics of intrigue, power brokering, money, and fear. I remember one time when I was in my secular career, one time I was having my annual review with my boss, and uh, you know, the way we did it in that company was you wrote your own review, and then you brought it to the review, and uh, if your boss didn't like it, you'd talk about it, and maybe it would change according to the boss's dictates, or maybe you'd convince the boss and it would stand the way you wrote it. But of course, this required a degree of self reflection and introspection and, and, and a, in the right way a self-critical spirit uh, so you didn't let yourself off too easy so I wrote my review and I sent it over to my boss and then you know we had our appointment scheduled and I walked in and so he has it sitting on the desk and he says to me I agree with your analysis there's not much to talk about here um, you know you're you're he was very complimentary you know you're good in all these areas and you're one of our very top performers. He goes, but you know, there's one thing about you. He goes, you don't really get involved in what's going on around here. I said, what do you mean? I'm totally involved. My head's in the game all the time. I said, what do you want to know about? To ask me right now. He goes, no, no, I don't mean that. He said, it's all the intrigue and all the backstabbing and politicking. You, you, you don't participate in all that. And he said, and, and with it, I think you have a reputation for being too kind. I said, too kind. He says, yeah. I said, I can be pretty tough on people. He goes, yeah, but I think what you need to do is have a public execution or two and leave the body hanging for a couple of days. That's literally what he said to me. Well, Daniel wasn't that guy, and I wasn't going to be that guy either. So what does this mean? In delivering results, which we talked about last night, don't make the mistake of becoming another one of those, you know, carnivorous people, a velociraptor. Don't be that. Right, the third thing about Daniel that made him succeed is he was humble. Now, he had risen to the highest levels in the kingdom. I just told you about that. He's one of three top, uh, top leaders, and he's about to be promoted above the other two. So he's going to go from, we could say in a corporate context, Jeff, from executive vice president to president or chief operating officer. That's what's about to happen with Daniel. And he had, well, excuse the pun, biblical class prophetic gifts, right? He is one of the four major prophets of the Bible. But in the midst of it all, he always gave credit to the Lord for those gifts. 
not for what he had maybe striven to himself, I probably gave the Lord credit for his intelligence and self-discipline and so forth, but some of that was developed himself. So there's a difference between gifts and skills. You build your skills, but gifts are given you by God. You can further develop your gifts through faithfulness with them. And obviously Daniel had done that. But when Daniel gives uh, the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, so we're out of the Persian period and back into the Babylonian period, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream <clears throat> And he wants the, you know, somebody to tell him the dream and then interpret the dream. So Daniel does that. But he says this as he does it. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, meaning including all of your wise men, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. So Daniel's giving credit to the Lord in a non, I mean, you could get too overdone with this. But nevertheless, in that setting, he's, he's acknowledging there is a God, and even if all of his gold vessels are in your temple, and, and you think that your God's over my God, well, my God's still got game, and this is what's happening, and that's why I can do this. Again, he doesn't overdo it, but he does do it. He, he drops the, the thing here and there. And that's important because in this dream... That, that he interprets in this dream that he interprets uh, he's talking about an image that has you know a gold head and a chest of silver and a uh, stomach of bronze and then the legs and feet of clay and so it's talking about the future of the world <laughs> at least as far as until the time of Rome but as he, he does all of this he he's talking about who God is again not in an overdone way and in the end because of that and some other seeds that he plants later on in his interaction with the narcissistic king that destroyed his family and home and city and culture and took him away to be a slave probably without his family jewels in, in all of that he gives testimony such that more than seven years later, more than seven years later, when after Nebuchadnezzar loses his mind and then comes back from that state, Nebuchadnezzar gives glory to God. So Daniel's playing the long game. Are you playing the long game in, in wherever you are placed? Very important question. I think one of the problems we have in uh, the modern charismatic world is we think we're supposed to go into the office and pray for couple people to get healed or give them a quick word of knowledge and get some quick wins on the board and then they're going to fall on their knees and give their life to Christ. Daniel told the guy his dream and interpreted it and he didn't give his life to Christ for about another 10 years or so at least. So stop being opportunistic and play the long game because this is why you're there. And you're not only there to lead the boss to the Lord, that's important, but you're there to administrate the righteousness of the kingdom. We saw that more in the Persian period than the Babylonian period, but it's the same guy. So we can, we can say this is the consistency of Daniel through his life, that everything he's trying to do is to bring about the righteousness of God in the workplace. And I, I, I carry around with me a statement of consecration from a man named John Lake. You might have heard of him. He's known for his healing ministry. But before he ever entered the, the healing ministry and was a preacher, John Lake had been a very successful businessman. And um, in like 1903, he was making $50,000 a year. I'm not sure what the equivalent would be today. I didn't look up the inflation. But this is, this is serious money. And John Lake, in his statement of consecration as a Christian, he said, from here on out, um, in everything that I do, I will be focused on demonstrating the righteousness of God in whatsoever thing I may be engaged. And that's what Daniel is doing. He's administering in righteousness. That's why they can't find anything to pin on him. Are you administering in righteousness? Even if you're just an accounts payable clerk, or maybe you clean houses for a living. 
I mean, you don't necessarily need to be some high-level executive, but, but do you have that as part of the center of your being? Is this your highest value? Because you realize that if you are righteous, people will see God's righteousness in you. This is more than just witnessing with your lips. It's witnessing with your life. And so, Daniel is this guy. He gives credit to the Lord, and what he says makes sense because of that consistency. And, and going back to the conversation with my boss about critical thinking skills and the ability to self-analyze, do you have the ability to see in yourself I'm not actually doing it well enough. I'm a little slack in the way I represent Jesus. I'm not talking about becoming anxious and, well, I, I, I'm just not good enough and God's never going to love me. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about saying I need to up my game and I need to be always consistent because that one moment where there's a lapse is the one time people will remember and they'll lock on to that. Does that make sense? All right, the fourth thing that made Daniel a success in this very difficult world is he developed good relationships with most of those around him, other than his opponents. Remember, we did have these guys that tried to throw him under the bus with his stupid law about you can't pray to anybody except the king. But, um, but beyond that, generally, he got on well with people. The first place he did it was with Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch under Nebuchadnezzar. We already talked about that a bit. But think about this. He presented Ashpenaz with a solution that was not only going to work for Daniel because he didn't want to eat the meat and drink the wine. He presented him with a solution that protected Ashpenaz. And Ashpenaz even says, look, if you start losing weight and looking gaunt, it's going to be my head. My job is to keep you healthy. And Daniel goes, well, let's just try an experiment. If it fails, I'll do it your way. But he gives Ashpenaz a solution that works for him. Remember what I said about how when you come to a leader, bring a solution? I did that last night with Joseph. Remember that? That's what Daniel's doing. He's living that principle. So he gives him a solution that protects Ashpenaz, and he's willing to let wisdom be proved right by her children. That's a statement out of the New Testament, but it applies here. And Daniel delivered results. Now, maybe he didn't know what the results would be, or maybe he did know what the results would be. But this all is the same as execution. This is what we do when we're in the marketplace. The other thing that he did, I'm still on point four, is later on, Nebuchadnezzar, when he has this dream about this image, and he first wants the image to be told him, excuse me, the dream to be told him, and then he wants it interpreted, and all the wise men are going, oh king, just tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, I know you guys. Once, you, once I tell you the dream, you're just going to dream something up. You're going to make up an interpretation. Sounds like a lot of modern prophecy. Did I just say that? <laughs> so, uh, so, Nebuchadnezzar becomes so enraged, he puts out an order and he says, I want all the wise men, all the astrologers, all the soothsayers, all the sorcerers in my kingdom, everybody who does anything in that kind of field of religion and mystics and all that stuff, kill them all. And so the commander of the guard in this case, his name is Arioch. So this is different from the guy we looked at last night. And that's his job. On a particular day, you're going to execute everybody. And so once this word goes out... Um, We'll just read the passage here, Daniel 2.12. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out that the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. And then Daniel replied, watch this with prudence and discretion. Prudence and discretion. Prudence means guarding your tongue, and discretion means knowing when to say what you should say and when to put a little bit more out there. And this is a pretty volatile situation because he's on the list for execution. And he's speaking to the guy who is, who's going to be the chief executioner. Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? That's an interesting question. Note that he's not making a statement. He's asking a question. That's a really good way to diffuse things in a volatile situation. If no one's ever told you that, take that one on board tonight. Why is this so urgent? 
You could kill him tomorrow, kill him next week. And so Arioch made known to Daniel the matter. It's interesting, Daniel may not have known he's on the list for execution. But suddenly he's won over this guy who's going to kill him. And Arioch, as we say, opens the kimono. And Daniel went in and requested the king appoint to him to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. So he bought some time. And then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Hey, guys, we need a prayer meeting right now. And so they, they collectively seek this out. And then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. He's losing sleep over this. That's why it's a vision, not a dream. Just saying. He might be pulling vigil, is what we call it in the Christian world. Staying up, praying about it, or maybe he's pacing, and he's like, oh God, oh God, oh God, <laughs> we're running out of time here. I bought a little bit of an extension, but Lord, you better come through. But whatever, he's awake at night, and he gets a vision. And then Daniel blessed the God of uh, heaven, and so Daniel answers. And so Daniel then goes in verse 24 to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. And the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. Remember that? We read that that was his name in Babylonian. Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen in its interpretation? And Daniel answered the king and said, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or astrologer can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. And then, boom, he lays it out. Now think about this. To get to this meeting, he had to convince Arioch. Because if it turns out this is all shuck and jive, probably Arioch's going to lose his head, too. Why'd you waste my time with this idiot? Now, that relationship with Arioch, that did not happen in five minutes. That was something that was cultivated over a period of time because of the way he interacted consistently over a long period of time as an exile. So he replies to Arioch with prudence and discretion, which was my uh, leading edge comment here. And this is very consistent with the way Daniel is portrayed in chapter 1. Skilled in wisdom, skilled in knowledge, and you know, able to stand in the king's presence, and of good appearance, and executive presence, and all of that. So he's, he's cool under pressure, and so he, he wins the interview, and then he gives this word to the king. So what he didn't do was go off on a rant about Nebuchadnezzar decrying his unreasonable and unfair rule as a, as a uh, narcissist. He could have done that, and he would have been right, but he also would have been dead. So part of the wisdom and discretion is knowing when not to be right, or at least to say nothing and make your point later on. And so um, back to what President Roosevelt would have said, he strove valiantly, remaining fearless in the face of death. And then... Interestingly enough, later on, when Nebuchadnezzar has yet another dream about this tree being chopped down, in Daniel 4.19, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. And the king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you, and its interpretation for your enemies. Now, you may not remember this or know it at all, but I will tell you, the name of Nebuchadnezzar's son is Belshazzar. Daniel's name is Belteshazzar, which in Chaldean means my little Belshazzar. So you know the term mini-me? Well, this is the mini-son. He's not literally a son, but by this time, a couple of chapters later, he's already been called this. Actually, it, it tells us up front when we're giving their Babylonian names in chapter 1. We read this, but I didn't call it out there. 
I don't think he was immediately known as Belteshazzar. He comes to be known as Belteshazzar. So when it's take, giving their Babylonian names to Daniel and the three young men, this is the one that he gets, but he earned the name. He is my son, as much as my own son, Belshazzar, is my son. And so in 419, this is how Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, watch this, he's dismayed. He could have been going, <laughs> he's going to get his. That tree's going to get chopped down. Hot dang. I've been waiting for the justice of God, and now it has come. But instead he says, my Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. Now, I think this is more than mere political cynicism and political instinct, you know, saying the right things to butter the chief's ears. When he understood this second dream about his impending removal from sanity and from the kingship for a period of seven years, Daniel was genuinely dismayed and alarmed. And so in this, um, he wanted this fate to fall on Nebuchadnezzar's enemies, not on him, even though, to say something I've said before, but I, we need to remind ourselves because this isn't our story and we could drop the, the fine detail here and lose the drama of what's going on. This is the man who had enslaved Daniel, probably ordered him to be castrated, had thrown his friends into the fiery furnace earlier in the story, who had taken his family away from him, whether they were killed or just deported somewhere else, robbed him of his Jewishness, destroyed his city and his temple. I mean, this is that guy. And Daniel has learned to love him. Daniel has learned to seek the good of the city. That's what Jeremiah had said. And in his own context, this meant the king. If you weren't working for the king, it might mean somebody else or your neighbors or whatever. But this is what Daniel is doing. He's living out the commands of Scripture in a most unpleasant and unsavory world. And so the love motive prevailed and was on display in Daniel. The fifth thing Daniel did that helped him thrive and survive in an, un, in an un-Jewish world, un-Christian world, is he used the gifts that God gave him and the talents he had developed for good and specifically to save the lives of others. He could have been out for number one. Now, again, I'm jumping forward to the Persian period, but he could have been out for number one the way the other satraps were, but he actually wasn't. He, he was there and he was serving well, serving God, representing him in that environment. And I said, this is our goal when I started out. I said, if your goal is to die with the most toys, that might be one way of putting it, but you have a higher ethic now. Jesus has called you to represent your father well. That's what Daniel is doing. So he did it with his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, gathering them to pray for the dream and the interpretation that Nebuchadnezzar demanded. He later did it for the sorcerers and conjurers of Babylon when he went to Arioch, and he saved their lives. You know, he could have said, oh, those guys are all into witchcraft and necromancy. You know, they're all, they're all bad guys, so, you know, let them burn or let them die. You know, cut off their heads, whatever. But he didn't do that. He, he was actually seeking to save his own life and the lives of many others. He didn't hide his gifts under a bushel. Jesus uses that language. Many of you have gifts that you are hiding under a bushel. Let me repeat myself. Many of you have gifts that you are hiding under a bushel. And the Lord wants you to bring them out from under a bushel and let your light shine before men that they may glorify your Father in heaven. You know what this looks like in practice? Holy boldness. It's tempered by wisdom. It's not brash because the wisdom that comes down from above is first of, first of all peaceable and gentle. Okay, so, but, that, but, it's, but it's still bold. You do speak out what you need to speak out when you need to speak it out. So sometimes we're called to courage and sometimes we're called to lay down on the tracks for other people. And this is especially true in the marketplace. I remember one time I was the CFO of an insurance company and I'd been put in there by a private equity firm that I knew from my time when I was in private equity. Uh, so anyway, I'm in this job and... Uh, I think Snake Pit would be a kind characterization of this place. But anyway, um, so one day I'm there at work and our CEO walks into my office and he goes, you know so-and-so? And I said, yeah. He goes, I want you to fire him. Now this is a lot like the story I told you last night, but it's a different story. 
So this is my first rodeo with, you know, dealing with bosses that want me to be the ax man. Uh, and I said, okay, uh, why am I going to fire him? He goes, I, I just don't like him, and uh, I want him out of here. I said, well, what did he do? He said, well, this is California. We're in, we're in at-will state. We can just get rid of him. I, I don't like him, and so get rid of him. And I said, well, wait a minute. This guy is over 50. He has a non-working wife and two kids at home. I said, if you let him go, or I let him go, he will probably, at best, replace half of his income. That might mean that his girls never have a wedding. That might mean that they never have a college education. Um, who knows what the impact of this will be in their family. I said, did he do anything wrong that I'm not aware of? No, I just don't want him around here anymore. And I said, okay, I hear you. And I'm trying to be wise and discreet, right? Prudence and discretion. And uh, I said, well, how long has he worked in this company? And his was shorter than the guy last night. It was maybe around 15 years. Um, and I said, and in 15 years, he's never been bad enough to fire. And suddenly today you woke up having a bad morning and this is the day he has to die. And he goes, yeah, that's a, that's a way of putting it. And he walks out of my office. I'm like, okay. So this is the deal. So I stopped and prayed. I'm like, Lord, what do I do here? Now, I have a non-working spouse and three little kids at home. And I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do here? Now, remember what I said. You are called to represent the righteousness of God in whatever you are employed. And in my mind, as much as I know of it, this is an unrighteous situation. And, of course, you always have to leave open. Maybe there's something I don't know here. But I tried to ask those questions so that I could ascertain if there was actionable reason. If there was, then I would pull the trigger. But I didn't see anything. And I didn't think this guy was the sharpest knife in the drawer, but, but he, was, he was okay, and he did good enough work, and if necessary, he stayed late and didn't grumble, and you know, he got along well with people in the office. He wasn't a troublemaker, so there was no particularly good reason to get rid of him, even if he was a B player, not an A player. Because not everybody in a company can be a chief. Right. So after praying about it, I walked down the hall, and I said, um, "I heard everything you said. You want him terminated, but um, if that's going to happen, you're going to have to do it. I can't be the one to do it." And he looks at me and he says, "If I have to do it, it's your job too." I said, "Understood." And I walked out. The next morning, the board fired him. And I was still there. I'm telling you tales from what it really means. And I can tell these tales because I was in the business world. You could have had it in government. Could have had it in the military. My daughter, Anna, the, the, the ranger, she had a particularly bad situation that I'm really not at liberty to discuss. But I'll just say one of her close colleagues threw her under the bus in the army and uh, the Army opened an investigation, which was ultimately dismissed completely. And then they opened an investigation on the close colleague who was demoted, which was actually the mercy of God because she should have been court-martialed. These things do still happen. Can you believe that God would do that for you if you are representing him? And so part of what it means to live in the Christianly in an unchristian world is to have the courage of your convictions when you need to have the courage of your convictions. I have other stories like this, but we need to end this at some point, so I'll keep moving. The sixth point that helped Daniel succeed as a, as a Jewish man in a non-Jewish society, or as a Christian in a non-Christian world, is he sought the good of the city where he had been sent, just as Jeremiah had said he should do. So think of your organization, and think of greater Boston, but think not just of big Boston, think of your little piece of Boston, maybe the few blocks around your house or your office. Think of that, because um, Daniel was seeking the good of the city. And to remind you of what we read in Jeremiah 29.7, Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. This is only a couple of verses ahead of the bit about 70 years. 
and pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare for in its welfare you will find your own welfare are you praying for Boston to flourish are you praying for Natick to flourish or if you don't live in Natick whatever part of it you live in do you do that on a regular basis I mean daily would be good but you might not do it daily but do you do it with any degree of frequency at all do you pray for your landlord if you're leasing property do you pray for the shop owners around you do you pray for the good of your city and again whatever your role is you might be in education you don't have to be in business I was so my stories are business stories but whatever it is that you do are you seeking that because we are blessed in life for our own benefit yes but we're also blessed for the benefit of others and that can have a lot of faces but it certainly includes doing good to others creating jobs and prosperity if you have any kind of a leadership or executive capacity as I did in that insurance company administrating with righteousness and justice even when you're being pressured to do things that are unjust and unrighteous it means providing fair and equal treatment to others and rendering uh, through our labors on the earth some glimpse of what God's fairness and kindness is all about. This is what we do. This is what we are called to. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy all the time. Mine wasn't. And if you think it was easy for me to tell my boss, you fire the guy, I won't do it, you would be wrong. I was scared. And I was thinking, what am I going to do because I got a non-working wife and three little kids that are counting on me to provide for them. But I fear God more than I fear my wife. No, I mean that. And so for some of you, your priorities, even though you think you worship God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, for some of you, you actually are pulling your punches at times because you, you, it, when, the, when the things are really on the line, God's not your number one. And you know it by your actions. That's a hard thing to say, but it's a really important thing to say. This, by the way, is identical to the issue that Peter and John faced when they were told, do not preach anymore in this name by the people who had killed Jesus. And what did they say? Judge for yourselves whether it is right in the sight of God for us to obey you rather than him. And then they go back to their own people and they pray up a storm, just like Daniel did with the three guys that were in exile with him. And what do they say? Lord, give us boldness. Don't let us back up. Don't let us chicken out. Make us bold to hold the line here. So it's, it's a really important principle. And I think in a lot of our uh, Christian renewal circles, we because of our triumphalism, and our sort of unstated belief, although sometimes, depending on who you're around, it is actually stated, that we're going to take over the world in the name of God. Because of that, we think that things can't actually go wrong, and we find ourselves in that situation. But you could and you might. So that's why we have to talk about these hard issues, even though it's not easy to talk about them. So he served the king, he served the Chaldeans, he sought the welfare of the city that he was in. And I've given you examples of what that would look like. Again, doing good to others, creating jobs, prosperity, providing fair and equal treatment to others, rendering justice through our labors on the earth. Now stop for a moment and think about what does this mean in my own context? Because yours isn't mine. And my story is from a little while ago. I don't have that kind of responsibility at this time. But it's all well and good to talk about sweeping visions of bringing the kingdom or justice. But here's, here's a simple dictum by which you can gauge a lot of your own activity in life. Righteous people act righteously. So wherever you are, act righteously. It is my, it is my commitment that I will represent the righteousness of God in whatsoever I may, may be engaged right now my line of work happens to be the ministry there are times though I really miss being on the coal face in business in some ways it was a lot riskier and in some ways it was a lot less pleasant but it's not necessarily a bad place to be because who else is going to bring the light of God into a dark world Psalm 84 6 says this as they fast pass through the valley of Baca they make it a place of springs Baca is a Hebrew word that means weeping. 
as they passed through the valley of weeping we could call it the veil of hardship all around them they turn it into a place of springs of refreshment again this is part of what you're tasked with doing if you're sent into the world so find the people who are destroyed broken wounded in need have no hope the very kinds of people that the woman I was describing earlier who's in the congregation tonight was describing the way the people in her world say well she knows God and she prays and so you know she we like her she's turning the place of weeping into a place of springs and if you knew what she did you would really get what that means but I can't say it because it would immediately identify her and again I don't know where the web stream is going to go to the seventh thing Daniel did is he paid heed to the word of the Lord both the verbal word of the Lord we could say the dreams and visions that he got but also the written word of the Lord because obviously at this very near date to when Jeremiah had prophesied he had been written down and inscripturated and Daniel was paying attention to that and he was pondering and praying through what was in the scrolls of Jeremiah and so he paid heed to that word of the Lord both the written as well as the now word the what we usually call the rhema word although by the way that's a misnomer because sometimes the written word is called the rhema and sometimes the live word is called the logos in Greek that's just something that somebody dreamed up in the renewal but what this meant was long before the return of Israel was at hand Daniel knew when it was coming the city had been taken captive in 586 BC if you knock 70 years off of that and remember you count backward when you're in the BC period that means in 516 they get to go home and so Daniel figures all of this out and when he does it's still six years until that's going to happen and so he begins to pray into that and you know call out to God for it and what ends up happening as a result of that Daniel if you're looking at a map of the Middle East Daniel's over here in in Babylon Persia and Jerusalem's over here Daniel can't leave he's I mean he's got a good job and he's you know as well taken care of as you could hope to be in such a context but he's not going anywhere he's got what we might call golden handcuffs so he's praying and his prayers ascend to heaven they ricochet off heaven and they come down and out of that Daniel raises two more prophets Haggai and Zechariah and so it says in the second year of Darius the king the word of the Lord came expressly by the hand of Haggai the prophet and he prophesied to the exiles who had returned Daniel raised up something I don't know if it was greater than himself but here's what Haggai said the glory of this house will be greater than the latter house and Haggai spoke to those returned exiles who'd been sitting on their backsides for 16 years enjoying life in the Holy Land with its nice Mediterranean climate and the good wines and the whatever they could harvest from the land Daniel prayed all that into being because he took the word of God seriously enough to anticipate when this was going to happen and so when we look at this life of Daniel you may have heard it taught as a book on the end times and you know the seven years of tribulation and you know whether you're pre mid or post trib rapture whatever but I'll tell you this the book of Daniel is a lot more than a book filled with teaching about spiritual warfare or the end times it shows us how a righteous man living in severe adversity in the marketplace was able to overcome his circumstances and represent God well this is your calling so about 20 years ago I worked for a company it was the best work experience I ever had I love that company I thought I'd found Camelot and uh, this was the same company where I went to China and won that big contract I talked about last night and um, several other you know key wins and part of why I was able to succeed was because the culture was amazing 
And we were led by a, by a man named Sam Ginn. That was his, uh, he was the CEO of the company. And I would swear Sam Ginn was a Christian. He was a Southern gentleman. But of course, he never talked about it publicly because he was at the top of the food chain. And again, all the things I said about you got to be really careful when you're in the workplace and the higher you go, the less you can say. But Sam had all these pithy aphorisms and things that were constantly falling from his lips. And when, when you were hired into this company, they gave you what we called Sam's placemat. They didn't call it that in HR. It was a, it was a laminated uh, piece of paper with our key values and principles and everybody was given a copy with their onboarding materials. And in my department, which was mergers and acquisitions and corporate development, um, in my department, when we were working late, which was often, a lot of times we'd order pizza in, and so we'd take out Sam's placemat and throw our pizza on there so we didn't get grease and pizza juice all over our desks. And then when we were done, we'd take Sam's placemat in the kitchen and rinse it off. And that's, so, but every night when we were eating dinner, we were reminded of our values. And I'll tell you something, any of us would have laid down on the tracks for Sam Ginn. We were loyal to this guy because he never did anybody dirt. And I remember one time um, he put out an announcement to the whole company and there was, I didn't never, I, I later found out who it was, but when he made the announcement, I didn't know who he meant. But he said, uh, it's come to our attention that uh, some of you may be playing politics and seeking the good of your own division or business unit over the good of the corporation. He said, this will not be viewed kindly uh, by my office, and such people will be removed. A few days later, a very senior level guy exited the company, and so did another guy. So Sam had this same you know, standard of righteousness that I've been describing. That's why I say, I'm, I'm certain he was a believer, but he couldn't let that be worn on his sleeve. But Sam had a saying, and it stuck with me to this day. I started out talking about how in our world everything is in shades of gray. But we are called to be light in a dark world. And so Sam's saying that stuck with me is this. There is no right way to do the wrong thing. And most of the stuff that you see in the news, most of the complexity in life, is people trying to do the wrong thing the right way. And then as we also said in corporate perfume the pig do you say that Jeff no. you don't okay that was my piece of the business world but that's what they're trying to do they're trying to perfume the pig but just stay, stick with that there's no right way to do the wrong thing so don't do the wrong thing and you say well but gosh you don't know what pressure's on me yeah I do because I've told you my stories and you know that I do so do the right thing because you honor God and in so doing you will live Christianly in an unchristian world and here are ended the words of Ken Fish. <laughs> Questions on any of that? Yeah. All right. So last night we didn't really do any ministry because um, because I was wiped out, and Greta excused you all. <laughs> but I do want to have um, a ministry time tonight. Oh, we we are now. You, you get never mind. Before we shift into that, we want to give you an opportunity to sow into Ken Orbis Ministries, Kingdom Fire, but uh, we'll receive it here at the bridge and then uh, we'll triple it. I don't know, we might. Um, so if you're making checks out, just make them to the bridge and we have baskets, we have baskets. No, we'll, 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 we'll hand it up. And, um, or you can text one word, Bridge Metro West to the numbers, uh, 94,000, and we, will, we changed the number recently, uh, and we will send you a link, and you can just select give there. We'll send you a secure link. It's way better than writing. I know some of you want to write your, your credit card number on the envelope, um, 
we need the gift of interpretation to read that often. So this is way better, and it's honestly way more secure. So uh, that would be great. And just memo Ken, um, or that guy, or Saturday, or whatever you want to whatever you want to put. We'll figure it out. Perfume the pig, yes, or put lipstick on the pig, or or just bacon. Yeah, thinking about it. But Father, we thank you for radical generosity. We thank you for the kingdom dynamic that's released when we give up authority of that which is in our hands and we place it in yours. We thank you for the fire that you put on a life that we get to do this. We get to sow in and it's a kingdom dynamic. We reap what we sow. It's just it's just a thing. And God, we we try so hard to bless you, but we can't outbless you. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We honor you in this moment. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll do that. Ken, come on up. All right, so last night we didn't, we didn't have a ministry time. And Paul specifically asked me to teach on these themes. Um, this morning I had breakfast with a friend who came up from New York. And he said to me, why did you teach that message last night to these people? Because they don't really even seem to be the right audience. I said, well, this is what Paul wanted. And, you know, he's the pastor here, so some of you obviously are guests, so he probably wouldn't have a read on you. But he knows what his own flock needs. And he felt that it was necessary to think about this stuff. And it's, it's partially because, I, I know this without even asking him, he probably has other reasons beyond this, but... This one thing I'm quite certain of, because the world is darkening as it is, um, even if you're not, quote unquote, in the workplace and you're a retiree or a stay-at-home mom who needs to interact with the school board that's trying to treat, t teach transgenderism to the children or whatever, I mean, this is Boston. I'm not, I'm not unaware of the context here. You, you are still facing these issues very much they, they they have a slightly different spin to them because it's not the workplace and so you probably can't get fired but you could be carried out of a city council meeting or a school board meeting i mean it's been happening you might end up on the fbi's terrorist watch list for daring to speak up about what your children are learning or your grandchildren are learning you guys know about that right yes. yeah so I think Paul is thinking about, given that, that you know, Christianity is declining in America, um, I know we're all expecting a great outpouring and an awakening, but it hasn't happened yet. And let me just tell you guys a statistic. Australia and the U.S. are very similar in a lot of ways. And I don't have the comparable data for the United States, but I can guarantee you it wouldn't be far off of what I'm about to say about Australia. So two weeks ago, a new report came out about the state of the church in Australia. Again, not the U.S., but it will be, it'll be very similar. And since COVID began, so that's about 30 months approximately. We're, we're just finishing up July and we're moving into August. And when we hit August, it will be 30 months since we had our lockdown. And arguably, COVID was around before that, just we weren't quite reacting to it as much. But we were in Israel, just, a, just footsteps ahead of it, remember? Yeah. So about 30 months ago. 30 months ago in Australia, 61% of the country identified as some kind of a Christian. Now this is not to say they were all devout or committed or consecrated or anything else, but they at least said, I'm a Christian. 30 months ago. And in the 30 months since COVID, that number has fallen from 61% to 44%. That is a 17 percentage point decline in 30 months. That's a lot. And in America, in the South, they're still generally more religious. Up here in Boston, out in California, not so much. But the best numbers that I've seen um, for the United States is supposedly three-quarters of our population think that they are Christians. Most are wrong about that, but, but that's what they think. 
So if there's been anything like that, then roughly 75% has fallen to about 60. And if we, if we blow the fluff off and look at the people who are probably at least attempting to be a Christian, whatever that means for them, they may be doing it imperfectly, they may be living in sin in this area or that area, but they still go to church or you know take communion now and then. That number would be lower than three quarters, but we're probably well below half. And here's the other thing. In, at Easter of this year, Easter of this year, George Barna came out with a new study, and in it, 6.5% of the U.S. population has a Christian worldview. 6.5% of the population of the United States of America has a Christian worldview. That means there's not more than 20 million people in this country who have a Christian worldview. We are decidedly in the minority. So we are living this reality with increasing frequency and urgency. And I think Paul is thinking about that when he asks me to talk about this. Does that make sense? So maybe the world shifted around you. It did for me. Maybe you thought you were living in Christian America, but now you realize you're in exile in your own land. And you're thinking about what's that going to mean for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years until I die or Jesus comes back. So normally in a meeting like this, we would have some sort of an altar call where we blow everybody up and pray for impartation and spiritual gifts and all that kind of stuff. I still believe in that and I still do a lot of it, but that's not what I want to do tonight. If you see the seriousness of the hour and you can relate to Joseph and Daniel, assuming you were here last night, and you see that you, you are looking at something, it's your own version of it, admittedly, but it has a lot of similarities to these two environments that I described. And what you really want is boldness tempered with wisdom. And you want that kind of wisdom and discretion to speak into the context of the world where you are. And to bring the kingdom, sometimes with healing and deliverance and words of prophecy. I'm not against any of that. But you also want to do it with these other factors that I was describing, like Daniel had to do in his own setting. And, and that's what you'd like to commit yourself to because that's the world you live in. And instead of running away from it or resisting it or hating it or hoping that you're going to go into the ministry someday and you know, have a better life. <laughs> Somebody caught the joke. <laughs> if you'd like to commit yourself to the purposes of God on the coal face where you are placed then I want you to come up and receive prayer. But I don't want you to do it just because I said that. I want you to do it because that's what you're committing yourself to. And you realize what Joseph went through. You realize what Daniel went through. And you say, notwithstanding, Lord, I will follow you into that. And I will do my absolute best to serve you well and to be that representative. Remember all the things I told you about Daniel. He was well read. Right? He had good bearing. You may need to up your game in multiple ways to pull this off but you're also therefore making a commitment to that process of improvement and accountability to that as you go forward. If you want that, I believe God will give you the anointing. And you know what? You might become a Joseph or a Daniel. I'm not saying in position. That could also happen. But I'm saying in terms of the giftedness, because I know this congregation, you guys, you guys want to be visionaries. You want to have dreams. You want to you know, you be that person. Well, both of those guys were that person in that context. So God may well pour out his spirit on you in that context, and you might become way more gifted as a prophetess or a seer or whatever, healer, whatever. That might happen. Probably will happen. But ultimately, when we talk about the fruit in our lives and the character in our lives and how that goes hand in hand with giftedness. I'm not now talking about the church context. I am talking about the world. And so if you want that, you'll probably get gifts to go with it because God always equips what he provisions or commands. But that's what I want you to come up for. And if you can't do that with a clear conscience, don't come up for this altar call. 
because what we're doing is we're talking about um, a group of people who are the collective evangelists of our age and we're going to lay hands on you for impartation for that come now if you're going to come the coffee's getting cold I'm really glad Blessley is here tonight. She's like a Holy Spirit barometer. She's getting wrecked. And so is Margaret. I know both of these two women. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know both of them. They came up from New York also. But the Lord's moving. Now the most important thing to do here aside from offering yourself to the Lord in prayer and consecration, is to yield. The reason Blessley's crying, the reason she's on the floor, the reason Margaret buckled when I touched her is because these two women yield to the Lord. When the Lord moves on them, they let him move on them. I don't know if the Lord will put you on the floor. He might knock you backward. Or maybe he'll leave you standing quietly but this is a night of consecration under the purposes of God. 